Okay, any other questions? If not, back to the lecture right at 8 o'clock. Um, so supinated, hands out, bones are parallel. If we pronate, which means to rotate in, palm now facing the back of the palm facing out, or I should say the back of the hand facing out, the, the palm faces backwards away from the viewer, the bones now cross and it becomes difficult to describe each bone independently of position because you basically have bones that are two different positions. All right, so feet flat on the floor, arms downward, palms supinated or out, and then face is directed forward towards the viewer. So the face is directed forward towards the viewer or the observer. Now one note of caution. If I get into the anatomical position here, where is my right hand? It's over here. Where is your left or where is your right hand? It's over on this side. So the observer, you are always going to have your directions switched. Now, for some of you, it's not a big deal. If you're as dumb as I am, you got to really think about it. And normally, I have to just turn myself around and like, like I'm doing something else. Like, yeah, so your right hand. <laughs> so directions are switched. Left appears on the right. So just be aware of that. I could give you a picture and I could say describe the position of you know such and such joint, the right side. And you might circle it over on the left side because that's your right and then it will be wrong. You definitely don't want your surgeon coming in and be like, okay, so we're gonna go into the right side of the abdomen. <laughs> no, that's your right. I can't find his appendix. Well, it's because you're looking the wrong part of the stuff. <laughs> okay, so that's the anatomical position. This is where we always start when we're dealing with any sort of description. This standardizes it. So we can describe things from the same relative position every single time. Uh, now, in addition to the anatomical position, we also want to have some references that we can deal with. And the references that we most frequently deal with, uh, especially in terms of movements and things like that, are going to be in anatomical planes and their associated axes. Okay? We're going to come back to all of these different terms here in just a little while. Those are called anatomical positional terms or position descriptors. Uh, so you have things that are towards the midline of the body. They'd be called medial, things that are further away lateral. And you're going to see that there are a variety of different terms. And you can always sort of be two of them that are sort of together, but they're opposite to use uh, to describe a variety of different positions and locations of anatomical um, uh, items. Before we go there, though, there is a series of planes and axes. And when you think of the term plane, think of basically a big flat sheet of paper. And when you think of axe, think of a pencil or a metal rod or rebar or something going through that axe. Okay? And I'm going to break these up for you. You can actually see that there are three different planes, each with an associated axis. Oops. I almost did it again. There we go, sagittal. Uh, so we have one of our planes that we named the sagittal plane. In the sagittal plane, it's going to be a vertical plane, so this is going to be this direction, vertical rather than horizontal, so it's perpendicular to the floor, if you will. And what the sagittal plane does is it's going to divide 
the individual into a right half and into a left half or section. So you can see the sagittal plane here basically goes up between the legs and out through the nose between the eyes and through the head. Okay, so if I get in my anatomical position, you can sort of insert this imaginary piece, piece of glass, glass, and I have a right half and I have a left half. Okay? Now I could actually rotate remaining in my anatomical position, and now you have this plane of surface where you can begin to describe things like elbow extent, uh, extension and flexion using this plane as your reference. So that's going to be a sagittal plane, left and right sections. Now, technically a sagittal plane can be right in the middle of the body, or it can be deviated to either side. So you could have a sagittal plane that cuts right through the shoulder joint. Or you could have that sagittal plane right through the eyes, nose, down through the, uh, the middle of the legs. Both of these are going to be named slightly different variations of the sagittal plane. The one that is right in the middle will be a mid-sagittal plane. In the mid-sagittal plane, we're going to have our right and our left sections are going to be equal. Then if we shift away from that mid-sagittal plane and we move the plane over to the right or we move the plane over to the left, it's no longer in the middle, and so we're going to call it a parasagittal plane. And this is going to divide things up on equally. So we no longer have an equal right half and an equal left half. We may have more on the right and less on the left. Now, when we're talking about the sagittal plane, and we have our right half and we have our left half, in reference to the middle, we can begin to describe things in reference to that midline. When you are towards the middle, things are said to be medial. And when you are further away or towards the outside, things are said to be lateral. All right, so notice that we have another vertical plane, and this is going to divide front half and back half. This is going to be a frontal plane. The frontal plane is occasionally referred to as a coronal plane. Again, it's a vertical plane. It's, imagine it's coming up from the floor, going up through the body. It's going to be a vertical plane, and we will have a division of front and back. So front and back sections. Now, in terms of descriptions, that front section is going to be said to be more anterior, while the back is going to be said to be more posterior. Anterior and posterior. Here, too, we don't typically name the uh, frontal plane a mid-frontal plane or a parafrontal plane. Uh, the, the plane just is either going to be more anterior through things like the face and chest and knees, or posterior through the back of the head, the back side, the back spine, down through backs of the legs and ankles. Okay? So posterior and posterior in the back, anterior towards the front. Now, our last plane that I'd like to talk about is the transverse plane. And the transverse plane is going to be, rather than a vertical plane, horizontal. So this is going to be parallel to the ground in which you stand on.
And this will divide the individual into an upper and a lower section. Now the upper section will be superior and the lower section will be inferior. Okay, so we have superior and inferior, above and below the transverse plane. So each plane is also going to have an axis. Now the plane and axis relationship is going to be one of perpendicularity. Is that a word? Perpendicular to each other. So the axis will be perpendicular to the plane. So the way, again, that I kind of try to remember all of this or model this in my mind, and may work for you, may not, is a plane I think of as a big piece of glass. So the frontal plane would be a big piece of glass that sort of cuts me in front and half. Sagittal would be that side, kind of side view left and right, and then chromal kind of right through, kind of right through the middle. All right, now, what would this be? Transverse plane. There's going to be an axis that runs perpendicular. Frontal plane, an axis that runs perpendicular. Sagittal plane, and its axis that runs perpendicular. Okay? So kind of keep that visual in your mind here, and we'll see if we can sort of name these planes, and, or I'm sorry, these axes that run perpendicular to each of the planes. So consider sagittal first. Okay, so here's our sagittal plane. You're looking at a sagittal plane. Here is the axis. How does this axis run? Can anyone give me some anatomical descriptions? Say that again. What? 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 No, I didn't say nothing. Wouldn't it run horizontal? Okay, so it's running horizontal, but are there any directions that you could give me? Okay, left and right. Um, uh, we're getting in the right direction. If it's more towards my midline, and if it's more away from, so we're going to call that the medial lateral axis. Okay, I think that this is going to be a lot easier for you. Okay, so let's deal with the frontal plane. So here's my frontal plane, here's my axis, anterior to posterior, so we're going to call that the antero, antero-posterior axis. Now, of course, things have got to be complicated. What makes the most sense for our, our last remaining would be something like superior, superior, inferior, or something like that. Um, it's not going to be the case. We call that the transverse plane. Uh, in terms of uh, the globe, does anyone happen to know, I'm talking about Earth, the globe, anyone happen to know what we call those lines that run um, yeah. So here's your globe. Kind of think of a big sphere here, and I put in my transverse plane. And I have longitude. Cheater. <laughs> so it's the longitudinal axis. I'm just trying to create these learning opportunities, these little uh, quirky creepy things that I do that help me to remember things like the longitudinal axis. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, so we got our planes, we got our axes. Now, what about our descriptive terms? We are going to call these directional terms, and we are going to use these to describe locations. We're going to use directional terms to describe locations. So here we are. What's the position? It's the anatomical position. And we have a variety of different paired terms here. So you're going to have two terms paired together that give an opposite description. So just some of the most prominently ones that we use, we have medial and we have lateral. Medial means closer to the midline, and lateral means further away. Then we're going to have terms like proximal and distal. Proximal means closer proximity to a joint or some other anatomical feature. So if something's more proximal, it's closer to that joint. If it's distal, it's going to be further away or have further distance. So it's more distal. Then we're going to have things like superior and inferior. Superior is higher, inferior is lower. Anterior and posterior. Dorsal and ventral. Okay? These anatomical terms, you can find them in your book. But there's going to be some special considerations that we need to um, take a look at here. All right, anyone happen to know from terms of, of gait what you are? Yeah, or how you, how you walk? I just that I Okay, no, not oh, those terms. Yeah. No, um, you walk on two legs or you walk on four? You drag your ah. knuckles or you walk on four? Okay, so we're bipeds. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, in organisms like humans, which we're primarily bipeds, uh, and we're primarily the only bipeds really on the planet. Now, yeah, chimpanzees and gorillas and even bears can walk on two feet, but if you ever seen a bear at the zoo, he's usually clapping as he's walking along, and he's like barely moving around, so he's not very mobile. But you put him on all four, and he can like run 35 miles an hour, so you gotta be afraid. <laughs> In humans and other bipedal organisms, The term anterior is the same as the term ventral. The term posterior is the same as dorsal. Okay, You probably will recognize a couple of these, especially dorsal. And you may know that fish and dolphins have dorsal fins. And those dorsal fins are on their back. Okay, So in bipeds, anterior and ventral posterior and dorsal. You go home to walk your dog or walk the cat if you have one of those weird cats that walks. <laughs> or you go out fishing or you look at a horse and these are quadrupeds or these are organisms where their face is at the front of their body rather than just positioned on the top of their neck like ours. Okay? Now in these types of organisms uh, in particular, animals like the horse here, the, the quadruped, what ends up happening here is where we have the face, the face is going to be anterior. The tail, posterior. The back, dorsal, and then the belly or the underside is going to be ventral. Okay, so remember that anterior and ventral, posterior and dorsal in bipeds are basically same descriptors, but in the quadruped, because we've now gone from our upright position to our 
four-legged position, we now have these terms being very unique from each other. One other small consideration to make here, and actually, once everybody has this, we'll make an adjustment to our screen. Everybody good? Okay, so um, the, the belly is ventral. One final uh, sort of special consideration, the terms proximal and distal. Okay, so these are our paired directional terms. And most frequently, proximal and distal are used to refer to our limbs, our arms and our legs. But we will also have directional terms next semester as we begin to look at kidney anatomy, and in particular the kidney tubules, which is a structure that's associated with the nephron, and also the intestines. And so we're going to have a proximal uh, end of the intestine and a distal end of the intestine. Okay, But primarily, proximal and distal show up in descriptions of the limb. Of the legs. Okay, so um, let's try a little uh, uh, exercise here. All are invited to participate. <laughs> and maybe I will take a seat as we do this, just for a few minutes. My legs are kind of sore. Um, describe these terms with directional uh, with directional terms. Okay, my hand in reference to my elbow. Okay, so really what I'm looking for there, distal is the correct answer, but it would be great if you said the hand is distal to the elbow, so that you include both what we're describing and what is being referenced. Knee to the big toe. Now we're just asking the trust. So we're, we're describing the knee to the big toe. So the knee relative to the big toe. Okay, so it's a limb, right? So what's our special consideration? The knee is proximal to the big toe. My head to my waist. Yep, so the head is going to be superior to my waist. My sternum to my heart. Sternum or breastbone to my heart. So let's take a look at it in the sagittal plane. Sternum is out here. Heart is going to be further back. Ventral would be good or anterior. The other thing you could say here, and a lot of times we'll do this, is we'll say that the heart is deep to the sternum. Uh, the opposite of deep is going to be superficial. So the sternum would be superficial to the heart. Radius to the ulna. Radius is out here. Ulna is over here. Radius is lateral to the ulna. Nose to the ear. Now you could describe this in really two different ways, right? You could give nose to ear in the frontal plane, or I could rotate over to sagittal, and you could give nose to ear. It's actually going to change the description a little bit, right? Yep, so nose is medial to the ear in the frontal plane, but the nose is anterior to the ear in the sagittal plane. Okay. You guys are all starting to talk like anatomists. <laughs> so make sure that you're reviewing those anatomical terms. In the back of your uh, lab book, you have more of those terms that can be utilized for those descriptions. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, the directional terms, you also have a variety <coughs> of uh, other anatomical descriptors 
in the back of the lab book, uh, including the major body regions. Okay, so the body regions. And we can start with, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, before I move on to that, this, before I move on here, body regions in the, in the, in the lab book, you have a, uh, a picture that shows the front of the body and then turns around and it shows the back. And so uh, the major body regions are going to kind of be divided up. So like the ear would be the otic region. The eye would be the orbital region. Back of the knee is the popliteal region. Um, so you can sternal region. So you can kind of look at those major body regions uh, in the textbook and also in um, the back of the lab manual. Those are some pictures that you're going to want to become somewhat familiar with. Okay. In addition to those major body regions, we can also uh, look at the skeleton. So rather than it being surface body region, the skeleton is going to have some uh, regions that show up as well. Groups of bones and things like that. And really when we look at the skeleton, there are two different um, the divisions of the skeleton. One is in green and the other is in purple. What is in green there is called the axial skeleton. And this is going to include things like the head, and the neck and the trunk. Not elephant trunk, but your core. In purple there, those are sometimes referred to as your appendages. And this is going to be your appendicular skeleton. And this is going to consist of your upper and lower limbs. Now, whether it's the skeleton or the body surface, again, your axial region and your appendicular region are going to be divided up into those further smaller regions, otic, popliteal, pelt, etc. Dorsum, and, uh, plantar, all of those are a variety of different uh, descriptors of body regions. So divided into smaller regions. And you will find those smaller regions. You will find those in your lab book. Now, when you look at the abdomen, uh, there's actually a lot of clinical um, uh, descriptions that can go into the abdomen. Uh, and, and in fact, there's um, ways to provide some diagnosis to certain types of conditions or issues. And so we do need to know the abdominal quadrant systems. And there's a four quadrant and a nine quadrant. And basically, you have a medial line and then a uh, coronal line or a transverse line that divides it up into four different quadrants. And you're going to have things like upper and lower and um, those types of descriptors. So you, descriptors. So you might have a lower right quadrant pain that would be uh, indicative of a burst or a ruptured appendix. Because that is what is underneath that anatomy or underneath that quadrant is those particular anatomical features for most individuals, things like the appendix. The nine quadrant system basically takes two lines, um, basically from um, usually people say perpendicular through the nipples, and then uh, divides uh, uh, two lines across uh, the, the belly horizontally to get nine different um, quadrants. Uh, for the, the abdomen. So I'm going to leave you um, the responsible to take a look at body regions and the ad ad abdominal quadrants, also those directional terms as well, uh, and then the body cavities. 
So the body cavities, again, this is going to be primarily your responsibility. The body cavities are going to be the locations or the uh, hollow spaces where many of our organs are going to be contained. So the brain and the spine are contained within the cerebral spinal cavity. And um, the heart and lungs and thymus and thyroid are contained within the thoracic cavity. And then we have the abdominal cavity and we have the pelvic cavity. And each of them contains some of their own unique um, organs from our different organ systems. And you can get handouts on the body cavities as well at the end of the lab books, uh, Appendix A, I believe, is, uh, where you would find that. Appendix A or Appendix C. Uh, no, I'm sorry, B. Appendix A or Appendix B. All right, one additional concept here that we need to be familiar with is uh, this idea of potential spaces. And you're going to find a few potential spaces in human anatomy. One of the most prevalent is in the female reproductive system. And this is going to be that pear-shaped organ where baby grows up to be born. And that's called the uterus. Under normal physiological conditions, the uterus really doesn't have any space. It's actually, um, it's basically a uh, completely um, packed in there. That's not a good word. <laughs> I'm losing it. <laughs> it's closed up. And then once a baby forms, it begins to open up and the cavity actually forms. So we're going to have potential spaces. These are going to be under normal conditions. So normal in this case of pregnancy or being pregnant or not pregnant is not pregnant. Pregnancy is going to be deviant physiology. So under normal conditions, non-pregnant conditions, the uterus is going to sort of resemble a deflated balloon. And we're going to have a potential space. And this is going to be a space that has the potential to become a cavity or become an, an open um, space inside of the body. Uh, yep, so the main... Example I'm giving here is the uterus of pregnancy. No longer exhibits a potential space, it exhibits an actual space. Um, I guess to give uh, another example of potential spaces, uh, you have linings around your heart, you have linings around your lungs, around the lungs they're called the, the pleura. Uh, plural membranes, and you basically have two of them. You have one that's up around the lung itself, and then the other one that's exterior to that, and it's basically surrounds the inside of the thoracic cavity and touches up on the ribs. Between them, there is a potential space. Normally, there is no space there. It's filled up with fluid, and it kind of resembles two Walmart bags. If you're to dip them in water, put water in there, stick two Walmart bags together. You can't really get the space to form, but you know it's there, so it's a potential space. In some conditions, uh, in particular something like a pneumothorax, you would get air trapped inside that cavity, and it would actually become a space. It uh, becomes very difficult to breathe. It's pathophysiological. You have to actually let that air out. Most of the time, what they do is they take a large gauge needle, stab it in there, and it sounds like a tire deflating as that air releases out, creates that potential space once again, and the individual actually begins to breathe really easily, even though they got a big needle in their chest. <laughs> Okay, last part of this introductory material. What is the meat of anatomy? Oh, man. Anatomy and physiology. The meat is going to be our organ systems. This is really what we are studying in anatomy and physiology. We are studying the organ systems. And we have... <laughs> 
depending on who you read, truly it's 11 different systems. We have 11 total different organ systems. Now, there are some individuals who say, oh, well, we actually have 12 because we have an immune system. The problem with that is the immune system is not a standalone organ system. It is part of another system called the lymphatic system. Uh, there's also people who say, oh, well, we actually have 13 because we have the immune system and then we have the male and the female reproductive systems. And to that I say, you're an idiot. <laughs> we have 11 systems. The male and female reproductive system are still just a reproductive system, even though the parts of the female reproductive system normally don't show up in the male reproductive system and vice versa. So what are the 11 systems that we have? And I'm going to give them to you uh, in no particular order. But we're going to start out with your hair, your skin, and your nails. And this particular organ system is called the integumentary system. Then we have all of the bones and the joints and ligaments, and this is called the skeletal system. The muscular or the muscle system, and typically what happens with the muscle system, the true physiological organ system known as the muscle system is going to be skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. But normally, and this is the way we're actually going to approach it, when we talk about the muscular system, it's actually going to just deal with skeletal muscle, the muscle tissue that moves the bones and other um, various tissues, such as your eyes. We're going to incorporate the cardiac tissue, the cardiomyocytes, when we talk about the circulatory system. And we're going to talk about smooth muscle, which is in a variety of different organ systems when we get to those organ systems. Uh, we'll find it in the vasculature of the circulatory system, we'll find it in the female reproductive system, we'll find it in the digestive system. So we'll deal with those things as we deal with the other physiological systems. Okay, so then next here, lymphatic, and this is going to deal with our defense against microbes. The immune system is a specific part of the lymphatic system. It is not a unique system on its own. Our main chemical regulator, electrical regulator of the body is going to be the nervous system. This is the most important system that we have in human physiology. It's the endocrine system. Anyone know why it's the most important? It's just one I would like. <laughs> so not really the most important. I just really love endocrinology. Uh, and so when we get to talk about that in a couple of months or even next semester, it will be a lot of fun. We have the circulatory system. Note that a lot of these, you may be like, oh, I didn't realize it was the circulatory system. I've always heard it was the cardiovascular system or something like that. What we're going to find out is the cardiovascular system is actually part of the circulatory system, just like the immune system is just like a part of the lymphatic system. Okay, so circulatory system, respiratory, urinary, Digestive, and reproductive. Respiratory deals with the movement of gases, mostly carbon dioxide and oxygen, from the external environment down to the level of the cell. Urinary deals with maintaining the blood and the chemistry of the blood and the makeup of the blood. Digestive system is um, the, digest, uh, the uh, physiological system that helps us extract raw nutrients from around, um, uh, from around us from the environment so that we can actually maintain our own cells. And reproductive is how we pass on our genetic material. Reproductive, again, 
there are male reproductive organs and female reproductive <coughs> organs. And so really when we look at reproductive, even though there is just one reproductive system to make up the 11 physiological systems, we can look at it from a male perspective and we can look at it from a female perspective. Little tidbit here, kind of outside of my notes, you all started out female. And you just happen, all the guys in here, you just happen to be one of the lucky few who had a gene on the Y chromosome called Kessin. Well, the few, because there's four of us in here, and there's, what, nine girls? What's that? I'm just happy there's guys in here with me this semester. Normally there are no there are no uh, no guys. It's all just a bunch of women, and it scares me. <laughs> all right, um, we're looking at about nine minutes left, and so I'm going to take a little bit of time to actually get a little bit ahead on our first night. Uh, so. We've gone through our introductory material. It's supposed to be our first three lectures. And we're going to move on to some of the material that we're going to run into next week. And we're going to deal with biochemistry. Now, I probably need to set a record straight. On this campus right now, apparently there are two different ways in which biochemistry can be spelled. And I'm going to give you the correct way to spell biochemistry. First, I'll give you the wrong way. That is the wrong way to spell biochemistry. The correct way to spell biochemistry And you can take that to Dr. Lofredo, because he put, it, he put it on his syllabus for biochemistry. He spelled it the wrong way. I couldn't believe it. He spelled like this, wrong. Now, what does this actually mean? It's funny, right? But what does it actually mean? Really, what it means is you're going to come from biochemistry in this class from a biological perspective. Chemistry deals with molecules. We're going to come at it from the molecules that become really, really important within the context of biology. Okay, so kind of beginning uh, this little section here. There are a total of 91 elements that naturally occur on Earth that don't have to be produced in the lab. We can go out and we can find them if we have the right technology and resources. Those 91 elements, you can find them on the periodic table of elements. And they're organized from hydrogen all the way through whatever number 91 is. In chemistry class, you probably deal with things like uranium. Who the heck cares about uranium? It gives us a little bit of power. It has nothing to do with biology unless, of course, it gets radiation. Then it kind of becomes a little bit of a problem. So chemists, they need to know all 91 of them. But you're not in a chemistry class. You're in a biology class. And so in all reality, you don't need to know 91 of them. You need to know more like 24 of them. So in terms of biology, when we apply chemistry to these 24 elements, this is where biology starts to come out. Now, if we're going to be really honest about it, those 24 elements that are important to life, there really only are just a handful that are in a high enough abundance where we see them pro uh, prominently displayed in molecules that are important. Schnapps, that's what you're looking at there, C-H-N-O-P-S, is an acronym. If you can remember Schnapps, you can remember the... Uh, some of the really important elements for life. I actually would add calcium in there because these are the most abundant and these are what I would call major elements. So I'm going to get rid of sulfur. Sulfur is going to be important, but I'm going to put in calcium, which normally comes as an ion and has a plus two charge. 
I'm going to put sulfur in a second list. And this can include potassium and sodium and chloride and magnesium and iron. Okay, in the second list, these are lesser elements. So the first list I gave you, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and calcium, these are very abundant. And we call those the major elements. Sulfur, potassium, sodium, chloride, magnesium, and iron, these are going to be lesser elements. Okay? So if you go through and you count it up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, that's half of your list, are major elements and lesser elements. That means there's 12 more that are left over. And these 12 remaining, or the 12 additional, are just simply going to be our trace elements. And they have lower concentrations than our lesser elements. So just to make sure we're all on the same page here before we move on, those are our major elements, and these are our lesser, and as listed, these are our trace elements. Now, many of these trace elements are going to be what we would call minerals. And these are important parts of the, the diets of uh, many types of animals, including mammals and humans. And these minerals are actually going to be extracted in small amounts from the soil by plants and then consumed by us when we either eat the plant directly or eat the organism that ate the plant. Okay, so we need to get uh, minerals from chromomism molybdenum, who would have thought copper, and that's another one. Extracted from the soil by, I don't know, cabbage. Rabbit eats cabbage, we eat the rabbit, we get the molybdenum. Now, from these minerals, we have a subclass of molecule called a mineral salt. And these mineral salts are actually going to be minerals that are extracted, but when they're put into a watery environment, like the extracellular fluid that surrounds all of our cells, or the intracellular fluid we find inside of our cells, the ionic bond that, that holds them together breaks, and we end up with charged particles. And we call those ions or electrolytes. And so we're going to get these electrolytes from mineral salts, and these are going to be important in function for nerves and, and other functions. When we come back here on next Monday, tonight's cliffhanger is going to be electrons. We will pick up there on next Monday.